Good morning. Happy Monday, everyone. Praise God. He's been faithful. He's awakened us to a new day, given us a new opportunity to fellowship with him, to have an intimate relationship with him, believing and trusting in him and knowing that he is our creator, our God, our everything. And we praise his name. Thank God for this new opportunity, this new day. God has blessed us and we should honor his name and the work that he does, given us all that we desire and all that we need. He's our God. We need to walk in relationship with him so that we might be blessed. Blessed by walking in truth and light. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning knowing that you are God, the creator of all things, and that all that we have belongs to you. We thank you, Father, for the gift of life, for providing for our needs, for creating this world this environment for us to flourish in. And we thank you so much for the sacrifice of your son Jesus Christ on the cross because that has reconciled us to you so that we might be called your children. Help us, Father, this morning to understand more of your word so that we might be drawn closer to you, to know you more intimately, and to walk in your ways. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, I thank you. Amen. So this morning's daily devotional is titled, Mentoring Through Tragic Seasons. And it's from the book of Ruth, chapter 1, verses 14 through 22. And it says, and they lifted up their voice and wept again. And Oprah, Orpha, kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law is gone back unto her people and unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee. For whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if aught but death part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left speaking unto her. So they too went until they came to Bethlehem. And it came to pass when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And they said, Is this Naomi? And she said unto them, Call me not Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty hath dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and the Lord hath brought me home again empty. Why then call ye me Naomi, seeing the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, which returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem, in the beginning 
of Barney season. Mentoring through tragic seasons. The tragic season in uh, the life of Naomi. She had lost her family, her husband, her sons, and was left with two daughter-in-laws. One left and went back home. But the other stayed and helped Ruth and comforted her and was her friend. The friend that she desperately needed during that time because she was obviously depressed and blaming God for her circumstances. Okay. The lesson today is titled Examples of Christian Mentoring. The central truth of the lesson is that God uses a variety of relationships in churches to produce change in his people. The focus of the lesson is to discuss mentoring strategies and implement them in the local church. The evangelism emphasis of the lesson is that evangelism can begin through mentoring relationships. The Golden Text says, in all things, showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned. And that's from the book of Titus, chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. Okay, introduction. The term mentor traces its origin to the ancient Greek literature when Homer in the Odyssey wrote of the mythological king Odysseus of Ithaca leaving his wife Penelope and his son Telemuch to lead his army. He placed Telemuch under the care of a guardian named Mentor, whose job was to protect and guide the young prince while his father was away. Recently, in business and educational services circles, the term mentor, meaning wise and trusted counselor and guide, has become prominent. <clears throat> Leaders recognize it is as a good idea for mentors to give personal guidance to less experienced individuals. Mentor is not a biblical term, but clearly this concept is present throughout the Bible. Jethro to Moses, Moses to Joshua, Elijah to Elijah. Eli to Samuel, Mordecai to Esther, Aquila and Priscilla to Apollos, and Paul to Timothy, Titus to Philemon, to name some. The psalmist David wrote, One generation shall praise your works to another, and shall declare your mighty acts. That's from Psalms 14. Oh, no, Psalms 145, verse 4. The lesson discusses mentoring strategies of the Apostle Paul and how to implement them in the local church. Today, we study and learn from Paul's ministry and instructions to two of his mentees. Okay, section 1. Men mentoring men, fathers and brothers, First Timothy chapter 5, verse 1. It says, Rebuke not an elder, but entreat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. In Western culture, boys are often taught to view other males as competitors. Early on, they vie for attention at home, in school, in sports, and in relationships with the opposite sex. In ancient human history, 
men were competitive as a means of survival. All too often, this instinct has isolated men from other men. Paul wrote about men mentoring men with younger respecting and learning from the elder, and the elder nurturing and helping to develop the younger. In this verse, Paul the mentor is giving pastoral instructions to his son Timothy regarding his pastoral relationship with his people. Timothy has been given oversight of a congregation and needed to carry out his duties in a biblical manner. To this point, much of the letter has focused on Timothy's pastoral relationship with God and his word. Now Paul addresses Timothy's pastoral relationship to the various demographic groups in the church, beginning with the men. The Enduring Word Commentary calls this section a summary of how to treat people in the church. Older men must be respected as fathers, and Timothy is told not to rebuke them. This seems contradictory when we consider Paul's instructed Titus to rebuke with all authority in Titus 2.15. In our text, Paul does not use the same Greek word used elsewhere in the New Testament. son for rebuke. Here it means do not strike or strike at an elder. Matthew Henry commented, Respect must be paid to the dignity of years and place of older men. In Paul's second letter, Timothy is charged to reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and doctrine. But he is not to lash out at or verbally attack an older man. Rather, he is to show him the respect he would show his own father. And to remember the Old Testament command you shall rise before the gray headed and honor the presence of an old man, and fear your God. I am the Lord. And that's in Leviticus 19.32. <clears throat> it is not true that a pastor must always treat everybody alike. Younger men in the church are not provided the same difference as the elders, yet they are to be regarded as brothers. Greater freedom is afforded the pastor in reprimanding your men, but only with brotherly compassion. As brethren um, shows younger men where somewhat equal to Timothy, at least in age. Therefore, he was to treat other young men the same way he would treat his biological brothers. See Romans 12.10. As an enter here that says, Honor older adults. It says, You are to rise in the presence of the elderly and honor the old. Fear your God, for I am old. Le Leviticus 19.32 An example for older men. Section 1b, Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. It says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. To Timothy, Paul addressed how older men are to be treated by the pastor. Now he wrote to Titus about the duties of older men who would qualify 
for that gracious treatment. <clears throat> sober in verse 2 means to be sober-minded or to be sensible and exercise sound judgment. Irresponsible choices and irrational behaviors are not characteristics of a godly elder. Rather, he is to be grave, which means dignified or worthy of respect. He is temperate, demonstrating self-control. Galatians 5.23 he doesn't fly off the handle or go to excesses. Godly mentors are sound in faith and motivated by love. Like Paul, they know in whom they have believed. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. And like Jude, they earnestly contend for the faith of the church. See Jude 3. They cannot be godly members unless they are grounded in Scripture. See Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 through 19. Because they are established in the love of God, they minister to others with the compassion of Christ. As mentors, they sow seed. And then, like the farmer, they wait patiently for its fruit. That's in James 5, 7. All right, section 1C, an example of younger men. Titus chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. And it says, Young men likewise adhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works, in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil things to say of you. Okay, the commentary says, Paul affords Titus more latitude in dealing with younger men. <clears throat> Yet, yeah. Their lifestyle requirements differ little from those prescribed for the elders. Matthew Henry wrote that young men must be exhorted to be considerate, not rash, advisable and submissive, not willful and headstrong, humble and mild, not haughty and proud. For there are more young people ruined by pride than by any other sin. <clears throat> and that's in Matthew Henry's commentary on 1 Corinthians. Paul alludes to a couple things that might constitute a stronger temptation to the younger than to the elder. Being sober-minded or self-controlled could be construed as an ad ad admission against the lust of the flesh. Although certainly not dormant in the lives of older men, the younger are more naturally tempted by such. Later in this chapter, in verses 11 and 12, Paul appeals for all believers to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. To the young men, there is a call to sound speech that cannot be condemned. This may allude to the temptation of young men to use suggest suggestive language or vulgar jokes. See Ephesians 5.4. The Bernan Study Bible says, Young men must use wholesome speech beyond reproach so that he who opposes us may be ashamed, having nothing evil to say concerning us. Okay, that's the end of section one. <clears throat> Very interesting. 
uh, about the relationships, the mentoring relationships of the men in the church, the old man, the young man, and how they must um, walk in obedience to the will of God, demonstrating their faith. Thank you for your time this morning. I pray this lesson encourages you to draw close to God and be blessed by his presence. He's available and waiting for you. Why aren't you seeking him? Be blessed. Seek God. Let him give to you the love that he desires. All right, have a great day.